be awesome. Show us what you're going to be working on. Uh, this is one of the most fun things about coloring night. We love to see kind of everyone's interpretation. And a lot of people like me got started early, which is great. All right. So um, we will, uh, at the end, we'll make sure to share these and see how everybody uh, kind of went with it. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce tonight's featured artist, which is UAB's own provost, uh, Dr. Pam Benoit. Dr. Benoit earned her master's degree in communication from Central Michigan University and her PhD in communication from Wayne State University. She has served on the faculty of Bowling Green State University as well as University of M Missouri Columbia. She has been chair of Department of Communications and also an associate and then an assistant dean of the graduate schools. Before become, uh, sorry, before being named Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost of UAB in 2017, Dr. Benoit came to us from Ohio University, where she served as Executive Vice President and Provost. Since her time at UAB, Dr. Benoit has truly made an impact uh, getting involved, not just with the departments, but with our students. She has spearheaded innovative changes to our core curriculum, and just recent, which was just recently announced, and has a very active social media account, making her one of the most publicly accessible provosts at UAB in recent memory. In addition to her professional accomplishments, Dr. Benoit has a profound passion for the, for the visual arts and a decades-long commitment to her own practice as a studio artist. So welcome, Dr. Benoit. Um, we're really excited that A, you're at UAB with us um, and <laughs> that you are uh, with us tonight as well. I am going to um, start my screen share, if you guys will give me just one second. And so while you're doing that, I want to thank everybody for coming and particularly thank Adam for putting together the coloring pages. He did just an incredible job. Yeah, Adam, um, if you want to wave, <laughs> yeah, he is our head of tech, um, and he is, he is a lot of the coloring sheets, if you guys have been coming to this, a lot of them have been done by Adam. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Yay. All right, well, let's go ahead and get, get started. Um, so, Dr. Benoit, how did you get into art? You're, a lot of your um, education and, and career has been in communications. Tell us how you got into art. Uh, so I would say when I was growing up, um, I had some pretty bad experiences in art classes where I had teachers tell me that I should try band and uh, not to pursue uh, any art um, kinds of experiences. And my sister, uh, on the other hand, was incredibly talented and uh, went to art school um, later on encouraged me to think about um, painting and that she would give me some pointers. So that's, that's how I really got started. I will say I come from a family where there's always been a lot of emphasis on doing creative things. My mom paints, my daughter paints, my husband paints. The, the family paints in different kinds of ways and does other kinds of creative activities too. So it wasn't unusual to... Um, fall into that. It's just that I never really thought I had any talent. So uh, what has influenced you with regards to art? So what influences your art? Um, so several things. There are artists in particular that I really uh, like. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in art museums. Um, I, I love the Impressionists. Um, Monet is one of my favorites, and I've had the good fortune of being able to see a lot of his paintings in art museums and, and really started to appreciate um, the, not only the final images, but the technique that got you to the point where you could create those images. And, and it, made me, it made me see the world in a different way. Um, it, it, you see color in a different way, you see line in a different way, and so it really, it really was a way of, of sort of opening up your eyes to the things that are around you and looking at them a lot more carefully than you do in, in ordinary life. And, and so that I really, I really appreciate. So I can definitely see influence uh, from Monet and, and others in your artwork. Um, you, you love 
landscapes and foliage, it seems like from a lot of the artwork that I've seen. Um, what specifically about that speaks to you? Why, why are you so drawn to that? Um, it, I, it's beautiful. Um, it, there's um, incredible, you know, in nature, there's interesting shapes, there's light, there's color, there's um, it, it. And then the other thing I think is I like, I, you'll notice that I've painted a lot of flowers, not exclusively, but I like to paint them because I can't grow them. Um, I, I'm a terrible, terrible gardener. And so this is sort of my way of capturing them instead of growing them. I understand that. Um, <laughs> I, I can't grow anything to save my life either. Yeah, I mean, um, I, can, I kill things, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, but I love flowers as well. Um, so what, uh, do you have any, so we've, we went through two already. So I want to make sure I'm not um, uh, skipping over anything. Uh, so with spring tulips and then um, here comes the sun, you were, went very literal with this title um, mm -hmm. and not as literal with this one. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions I sometimes get as the museum educator is how do artists come up with their titles? And I, I don't even know that I know the answer to that. It just seems like that's the right title for that painting. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, sometimes it's evoking a feeling as opposed to talking about what the subject matter is and trying to express that in the title in some way. Mm -hmm. Does, um, does the influence for the painting ever um, also play a part in how it's named? Oh yeah, of course, of course. I, I will say, I, um, I know this might sound a little odd, but I, I dream about paintings. Um, and, and sometimes when I'm in the middle of working on something, I, I dream about it a lot when I'm thinking about, well, what would happen if I did this? And here's the way it might look. And so there, I, I know that it's a, you know, I, it's part of my subconscious thinking about the way in which that, it's almost as if it has to get out onto a canvas um, because it's in my head and I'm, I'm trying somehow to get it, to get it out and get it painted. And sometimes it ends up being very much like what I thought it was going to look like. And sometimes it ends up going off in its own direction and becomes something entirely different. Which is a, almost an extension of the dream itself then. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, this one uh, in particular, I absolutely love. I noticed a lot of people uh, are, are coloring blaze. Uh, do you want to tell us the story behind this one in particular? Sure. This is actually one of a set of two of blaze. The other blaze's head turns the other direction. And um, I painted it specifically for um, the UAB alumni association scholarship uh, reception where they auction off all kinds of things including paintings and so this was one of the ones that um, that set got auctioned off during that painting and raised money for undergraduate scholarships at UAB. Mm. Happened I, during the 50th anniversary so it was very relevant at the time. And I, I love the word that you use to describe this one very whimsical. Um, yes. I, I love it. Um, so, so uh, I, one of the things I would say is that I'm not, I'm not really very interested in trying to paint realistically. I probably don't have the talent to paint realistically either, but I, that's not, that's not why I like paintings. That's not like why I, why I try to create certain kinds of paintings. What I'm really interested in is creating, um, an effect with the painting, not trying to make it look like a photograph that that's not. That, that isn't interesting to me to try to reproduce something so that it looks just like a photograph. I can appreciate the talent that goes into creating those kinds of paintings, but that's really not what I'm, what I'm interested in doing. So with that, um, how do you feel like your professional life plays into how you approach painting? Because I know you're in communications and the way you've talked about painting when we've discussed it before is almost as if it's its own form of communication. So how do those tend to play off of each other for you? So they're both creative expressions. Um, they're, I think, I think I, I said earlier that, you know, a lot of what I do for my job is very 
um, analytical, um, it's very left brain, um, and yet there are times when you need to be creative. There are times when um, you need to think about being innovative and thinking about doing things in a different way, and, and um, painting sort of primes that for me, thinking about ways in which you might explore or experiment or do things in a complete a completely different kind of way and so and then I would also say the other the other big impact for me is that it's a it's a stress relief for me so I have a pretty stressful job and um, when when I'm painting I'm not thinking about all the other issues and problems that um, are on my agenda I really I you get lost in the painting and you're not thinking about other things. And that, that I really like. I, I completely understand that. Um, that I feel like art in general, whether it's performing arts or visual arts, that is such, it can have such a healing component. Um, right. It's like a release. Yeah. You know? It's, um, and, and the other thing I think, I think I've learned over time is to give myself permission to, create a bad piece you know that it, not everyone is one of them is going to be a great um final outcome and and i won't like them all but if i've learned something in doing in doing it then it's still worthwhile even though i may not like the final impact we talked earlier about sometimes you can overpaint something and then it then it's you know, the colors are drab, it washes out, it doesn't, uh, you, you haven't captured the light in a way that makes any sense, but you still learn, you learn from your mistakes, you learn from things that you shouldn't do the next time around. Yeah, and um, also, you, I, I, I'm going to fast forward through one of these <laughs> slides, because um, that brings me to, you had a comment on texture, and particularly with this painting. And so I feel like that experimentation, um, can you talk more about why playing with texture was really important? And yeah, this is fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so try, trying to um, create something that's, that's new and interesting. And so I, I, love, I love thinking about how you might create different textural effects. So this is a, a water-based oil and the, the inset there um, that blows up the texture gives you sort of a sense of what it looks like um, and it's done with um, gesso and tissue paper and um, multiple um, layers of that and then painted on top of that and I really liked it because I thought it helped to create sort of the textural effects that you see in sort of an impressionistic way of, of what grass looks like. You know, like when I look out my window right now and, and see the grass, it isn't one color of green, it isn't all completely level, but it has it has these crevices, it has these ins and outs, and this is that's what this was trying to capture. And I, I really like the way it turned out. Can you tell us the story behind this one? Because it the tree has a heart in it, so I feel like this one yes. has a more personal connection. It does. So the name of the painting is I'll Meet You There, and it's about um, meeting somebody special in a special place. Um, and, and you may have had this experience too where, you know, when you're trying, I, I do this all the time, when I'm trying to sleep, I frequently will think about where is my happy place? Where is the place where I feel the most comfortable, the most calm, and and it, it looks like this. and um, but it also looks like this with the person I want to meet um, on the top of that hill, and so, so this is this is again trying to trying to capture a feeling uh, with the painting. I love that. Um, well, this is playing absolute, with the texture. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is an absolutely gorgeous one. I think this is the one we ended up choosing for uh, the social media and the um, the post. Uh, so, and you said. It, that this one also has a, a pair with it? It does. So um, this one, the, the one that we have on the screen is uh, painted more in spring. You can see that the greens are really vivid, that the sky is pretty vivid. Um, I have one too that's the fall and um, the it has, it's um, done in a horizontal um, piece instead of this vertical piece that you see here, but the, the bottom that's textured is um, 
more in uh, burnt umber and ochre and oranges and yellows. And then the same thing with the trees, fewer, fewer leaves on the trees. It also has the tree with the heart um, in the middle. And, um, but it's, it's from a, it's the same idea, but from a different season. And you probably know that Monet did a lot of that. Um, he did all the haystack series, which I, I really like looking at them in different lights and seeing what impact that had. And that was sort of what I was thinking about there. And maybe eventually I'll do them in the other two seasons as well. I just haven't gotten to that. Well, um, another, a project for another stressful day. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so uh, this one also has a lot of texture. Can you um, tell us about this one? Yeah, so this one is um, also using this technique with um, the gesso and the tissue paper um, around the outside of the heart in the blue. And then I also like this idea of um, putting um, some gold leaf onto the heart. So I, I played with that a little bit. And I don't know if you can see in the close-up, but there's a key that's um, glued onto the heart as well. And so, um, you know, it, again, it's, it's, um, it's talking about, you know, very strong relationships where it's only that person. And, and we talked a little bit earlier as we were first starting about color. This is a good example about where the blue um, in the background is setting off the red. So mm -hmm. thinking about how those two colors combine was part of the, the thinking here. Um, you know, so looking at complementary colors, looking at what, what color will make another color pop if you put them side by side was part of, part of the thinking in, in painting the painting. So with that, I want to tie that back to emotion then um, and like what it's trying to communicate with uh, with the heart having its own shading and then the, the background having its shading and then the complementariness uh, is it, it does the feeling change as it goes across the painting or like what does it is this going to be multiple emotions with it? Or is it just kind of an instance or a memory that you're trying to convey with it? So, so the fact that the heart isn't a single color is trying to convey how um, complex relationships are and that even loving relationships have different periods of time, um, that they go through periods of time where the key is very obvious and you have access and times when you don't really have much access and you have to work harder in that relationship. So that's a piece of it as well. Um, another question I have going away from texture then, um, what is the size generally of the painting? Do you do, you do mostly large or is it mostly small? Um, they're mostly big. They're mostly I like big. painting big, yeah. Yeah, we have um, a question from the chat that was very similar to that, which um, what's the most frequent size do you choose? Of your canvases? Um, I Right now I've been really interested in um, uh, rectangular canvases um, that are fairly large um, but I, 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 when, I when, if I'm gonna spend a lot of time on a painting I want it to I want it to go I, I little paintings are, are um, there's no good place to hang them there's no good place to put them and so I, I like I like really big paintings. I painted some small things, but they're not they're not as interesting. So like thirty six by forty eight, um, those are those are the kinds of sizes that I like. I would like to piggyback off that and ask because I just had this thought: Does the size play into like how this is a stress relief too? Because I feel like oh yeah, you're constantly like yeah. around your computer all day. Mm -hmm. So being around a small right. canvas, right. yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus you can really um, get into it when it's a big piece of canvas. You can, you can, um, it actually is sort of like exercise sometimes to, and then I, I will also say that after, usually after I've done, I have paint clothes that I wear because it's all over me. It's in my hair, it's in my toes, it's all over me. And that, that was a good painting session if I come out looking like I've been dumped in a paint can. Um, so I'm going to fast forward through some of the slides again, and I promise I know everybody wanted to see pictures of their the ones that they're doing. We will come back to it. Um, but you do have one where you're in your studio mm -hmm. and it's actually um, so this one's abstract art. This seems like it's a little bit of a departure from 
what you normally work on and we can see another canvas in the in the background so, yeah, so this is not in my studio this is okay. at um art blink that is uh, um, on at the University Hospital at Kirkland Clinic, uh, raising money for the Cancer Center, where they invite, um, I think it's like 19, 20 artists. You paint a piece in 90 minutes, and then they auction them off. And so um, that's, that's what that was. And, and it might seem like a departure, but in my mind, it's not really, because once again, it's color, it's about light. It's about creating some textural effects. It's just not as representational. So I, I don't see them as, as being that different. I, yeah, I can definitely see that now. And, um, and I, I want to ask, I was very curious with um, this one. It seems like there's also a lot of texture with it. Oh, yeah. As well. And okay, I, it's always hard to tell when it's on a computer screen. So I just, I wanted to mm -hmm. double check, but um, it seemed like that would was playing into it as well. And as you um, can imagine, here, here this one involved uh, getting a lot of paint everywhere too. <laughs> because, oh, of course. Yeah, but you can see sort of the size of the of the painting too. That it's really it's really pretty large. So, and there's scraping that went into this. There were underlayers that went into this one in order to in order to create the effect. So for Art Blink, can you prepare your canvases? Um, no, ahead no. Of time? It has I have to, to bring. Just a blank canvas. No underpainting can be done before you come, no drawing on the canvas. And so I, I will confess that I practiced it three times before I went to make sure I could do it in 90 minutes. I, I would have done the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I absolutely would have as well. Um, so I'm going to start going. Go ahead, Rachel. A couple questions from the chat. Is now a good time? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so one question is, um, let me read it exactly. Um, how often does she paint? I'm curious with her stressful and demanding job, how she makes time to paint. So not as often as I would like. <laughs> um, I usually paint on vacation. Um, in fact, when I went on vacation in January, I painted every single day I was on vacation. It was wonderful. Um, and then um, sometimes I, I can get a little time on a weekend to do some painting. So that's, that's really about the only times that I get to do it. I'd like to be able to paint more, but it's just not possible. And right now it's really hard to get time. And then we have another question. Um, I would like to know if Dr. Benoit always has an image in her head before she starts painting on the canvas or does an idea simply evolve as she paints? So it depends. A lot of times I've already thought about it. In fact, I've thought about uh, where the focus is in the painting. I've thought about color. I, I've thought it through pretty well. Other times, um, other times I, I've usually thought about something in advance, but it doesn't end up going that direction. I see something and I think, oh, now that's sort of an interesting um, effect. Let's see what we can do to play around with that. And so, so that it does it's not always predetermined. And we have some more questions. They're coming hot and heavy. Okay, so we've got another one from my wonderful supervisor, Heath, and he says, Art Play Loves Dr. Benoit. Would love to ask her to elaborate on her using art as a tool to lead in her current position. She used art in a dean's retreat at Art Play. Yes, Heath knows all about that because we had our dean's retreat over in his wonderful um, house. Um, so I, I, um, I have a retreat with the deans every fall. And this fall, what I asked them to do was to paint. I gave them a small canvas. I gave them paint. And I had already drawn on um, concentric circles. So you, you know this painting with the concentric circles. And so they each painted their own. And then we put them together. So Kelly Nichols, who's on here, is the Dean of Optometry. And she participated in putting that uh, one of her squares as part of that painting. And then I, then I screwed all the squares together so it made one huge painting with about 12 different um, circle, concentric circles that had been painted in all different ways. So, and again, it was pretty interesting. I don't know if Kelly would, would have another comment about this, but I found it interesting how... I could, I could see when they were painting that they were also letting go, um, that it, 
also they could see that it was a stress relief. At first, people were kind of like, mm, I don't know whether or not I'm interested in doing this. And then I think people kind of got into it. And so, for example, the dean of medicine said, I don't know if I have the proper tools to do a good job here. <laughs> so you can see people's personalities coming out. Kelly, do you want to add something? He also said, um, when I mix yellow and blue, what do I get? Yes. And we're like, I think we found the one thing that Selwyn Vickers might not be good at. <laughs> <laughs> it was but great. Actually, his, his painting was wonderful because they really were all very, um, very distinctive to the person. It was really yes. a wonderful event. It was a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. Yeah, it was I, great fun. I love that idea because at Ava, we always try to push uh, that art is not just the art anymore. Like it's, it, there's, there's so many disciplines that go into art and, um, and it can be used in so many ways. And so uh, the fact that you're using that in a very multidisciplinary way is, is so wonderful. And it, it, it's something that we love to do a lot at Ava too. Um, Plus, I also know that um, that particularly at art play, you know, there's there's a wonderful community feeling of of painting together, and so um, that was also part of part of the goal there is to have people, um, you know, comment on each other's, um, ask each other for advice about what color they might want to use. You know, then that a lot of that happened too, and so it was it was really a great thing to do. All right, we have some more questions for you. Um, the next one is, is it easier to paint on an easel or flat surface or both? Um, I've tried both and I actually like a flat surface better than an easel. But I think it's personal preference. Then the next question, you spoke about how making art is about seeing things more clearly. Do you use that artist's eye in your day-to-day -day and professional life as well? I do. Um, I, I think I think it's train, it trains you to look at things in a different way, and it's not just objects. It's also people, it's relationships, it's, it's um, looking for the deeper level. I, I, um, I mentioned earlier that my daughter also paints, and I can remember very early on taking her to a lot of art museums and then sitting outside one time with her and asking her to tell me the colors that she saw in grass. And of course, her first reaction, well, is of course, it's green. Well, no, it isn't really just green. Look at the reds in it. Look at the browns. Look at, you know, there are lots of other colors there. And so that, that's part of it is starting to see the variability, starting to see the complexity that nature gives you as a palette. All of that is, is, is part of that. And then and then when you take that to think about, you know, how people interact, how you problem solve, there's that same kind of complexity. And I think having your mind think in that way um, helps you to see things in a, in a more vivid way um, at, in professional environments as well. Then we have another question. Uh, what is the fav your most favorite piece that you've ever created and why? So I, I, I'm not sure that I have a favorite. I have favorites for different reasons. Like one of my favorites is a piece that's called um, The Very Bad Day. And um, it's an abstract and, um, and I pretty much threw paint at the canvas. Um, and, and, and there's, it's interesting, it's in my office. And one of the things you can see in this painting is that there's a lot of dark, not surprisingly, but there's also there's also light in that painting. And, and part of what I think you see there is that even though it's an incredibly bad day, it's this day and the next day is going to be better. And so there sort of this idea, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel that even, even, even when things are really crappy, there's always something else that you can look at that's a positive. There's a, there are good things that happen in bad days. And, mm -hmm. and that, and so I really like that painting because there's this wonderful, um, wonderful variation in the blues in that painting and and um it, it it again it evokes a very specific emotion um that reminds me you know keep at it it, it will be it'll get better 
And then the, some of the things I've shown here are favorites, like the, um, the sunflower that we, we had earlier, I really like because that painting is not overpainted. And, and I was so proud of myself because it would have been so easy to have continued to try to add a little detail that it's a watercolor and the wonderful thing about watercolors is that um, the, they'll, go, they'll go wherever they want. And so um, trying to uh, allow for that and yet still capture what you want is, is quite a task. And I think, I, I think that happened in that painting. That one actually is a small one, but I really like how it turned out. Um, I, I just realized I haven't been doing my job that I promised to do to keep flipping through because um, I, I love how you're talking about your art. Um, I'm sorry, Rachel, I just jumped in. Were there more questions? No, we are actually at the end of questions for now. Okay. Continue. Um, well, uh, so we, we talked a lot about art, but you also didn't live in the South for no. a long time. And John, I'm stealing your question. Um, unless you wanted to, I know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, oops, I, there we go. Okay. Um, so you moved here from Ohio and a lot of the schools that you were at were in the Midwest. Um, has moving to the South influenced your art in a different way and kind of, you know, uh, do you have a different perception? Like what has Birmingham, what, what drew you to Birmingham? And then how has, has that been reflected in your art? And then I'm sorry, this is a second part to the question because I want to make sure I ask it. How has COVID uh, in this whole time really influenced your art? So I would say that I came to um, Birmingham because of the job at UAB and I'm delighted that that happened. Um, it's a, great place to work um, and and I have wonderful colleagues at UAB so all all of those things were part of that although I will say that that I didn't initially when um, you know in the, in the kind of job that I have there's a search firm and initially when they contacted me I was not interested in uh, coming to Birmingham Alabama and part of that was I wasn't particularly interested in coming anywhere in the south and I'd, all, I'd lived for a long time in the Midwest. Um, it's very different than the Deep South. Uh, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Missouri, Ohio, um, and hadn't really gotten out of that region at all. And part of it is that I have relatives on my dad's side in South Carolina, and they, if other people are like my relatives, I did not want to come to the South. <laughs> And so I, I would, that was sort of the, it took me back a little bit. So I finally decided that I would, I would look, you know, I read a lot of the material. I would come and visit. I would see whether or not this would be a good place for me. And I, I was blown away. I was blown away by um, the incredible innovative spirit at UAB. I was blown away by the city of Birmingham. It is not what I thought it would be. And so all those things really, uh, were very strong motivators for for making the move because I was very happy where I was. I didn't need to move. It's a similar kind of position, and yet, yet it's almost as if it called to me. Um, in terms of my art, the thing that I think is is impacted by Birmingham is that the light is different here than it is in the Midwest, yeah. um, and so that. That I've really, I've really noticed, and I've tried to capture some of that. I don't know how successfully, but it's de it's definitely, it's hard to even describe. It's um, it's even it's almost a more intense kind of light than I uh, was used to seeing, and so, and and then the other thing is that, um, like in the spring, the colors in in Birmingham and Alabama are so vivid, so vivid, and. And, and when you look at the Midwest, it's almost like it's a pale comparison to the kind of coloration that you get that you get here. So those are those are sort of things that I that I have noticed as I've been here. And I, I know another thing that people who've moved here often comment to me is that we have so many trees. Yes. Um. <laughs> and flowering trees. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which are just gorgeous. Although they play havoc with my allergies, but 
but I really, yeah, I really appreciate how beautiful it, it really is. And not what I expected. And also not what I expected in terms of hills and mountains. And I mean, the topography is, is pretty incredible too, especially when you've lived in a lot of places that have been entirely flat. So, so it, it's really, it's really a cool place to live. Um, I, I, I have to agree. I moved here from Colorado. I am originally from here, but I had gone off to school in Colorado for four years and loved my friends there, loved the mountains. Um, and I, I have to say, I did cry when I left Colorado mm -hmm. and to move back to Birmingham and I got here and it only took a few months for me to just kind of exhale that this is not what I remembered and um, not, you know, it, it always shocks you in the fact that Birmingham is so alive and always, mm -hmm. I think, has also yeah. been. Although really I feel like I've only scratched the surface. There are so many things I still want to do and see. And, and so I, I have a lot more looking around to do. Yeah, I, I do as well. Um, okay, um, so I, I have another question. Um, that I'm just going to, John, I'm just going to ask your questions. Um, <laughs> uh, you are the most that I know of the most provo uh, the provost that has been most accessible, uh, to your student body, uh, to, uh, the faculty and staff and in person as well as, um, online in particular online. Um, so, uh, you've uh, com completely transformed the way our society operates on a global, uh, global level and, um, and uh, or sorry, social media has uh, changed how we kind of operate on a global mm -hmm. level. Um, so where do you, what role do you see your social media playing um, in your position at UAB? So when I first came, um, I had a couple people from communication and marketing talk to me about the prospect of uh, beginning to uh, be on Twitter or to do newsletters or to do Instagram. And we ended up choosing Instagram because it was visual and it was easier. And I thought I might actually be able to do it and um, not have to get tutored um, every time I tried to do it about how to actually um, post something. And since then, um, I have to call out Karen Templeton, who's on this call, because she helps me a lot with thinking about what do we need to put up there and helping me um, highlight the wonderful activities of our students and our staff and our faculty um, across the campus. So, so I'm, I'm trying to use it to, to help people see, first of all, to see me as um, something more than my job. And secondly, to really highlight the incredible accomplishments of the campus that I, I'm so proud of. And so that's, that's a, that's, I think it's a very useful way of getting that information, information out to everybody else. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so after, um uh, do you want to, well, we'll do this, the, um, the Instagram handle in just a little bit. I know we're, we're getting really low on time. Rachel, was there any, if you guys have any last minute questions, I'm going to read off the last question I have. Um, but go ahead time and make sure you, so fast. Yes, it really does. I feel like these things could go on for several hours. Um, but so many, uh, so many, uh, people may not know this. Uh, and I hope this isn't something, uh, again, this is John's question. Uh, <laughs> I hope this isn't something I'm just making up, but you seem to have built a reputation at UAB for innovative team building strategies when it comes to your own staff. Some of your academic research seems to be focused on interpersonal communication leadership. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this? And I know we've done a, a little bit in particularly in how it, uh, you see the role of artwork in your professional life. Um, but do you, how, um, you've, you've experimented it with, with it on the Dean's level. How do you just see this impacting academia, um, in general and, you know, using art more? 
So one of the things I got to do was um, uh, go to an honors class and um, do some art activities with this this class and and that was really fun. I because I I love being in the classroom and yet um, in my current job I don't really have the luxury of teaching um, and so to be in a place where it's possible to um, share my love of art and particularly for students who sometimes get really stressed. It's a way to show them that this can be a wonderful outlet for them. Um, and so, so I, you know, in general, I feel like, um, I feel like art is a, a way of reminding us of our humanity and uh, particularly now um, it's, it's really important to, um, to have that as part of um, who we are and to recognize how important it is to be expressive about what we think and feel. It's another way of being able to do that. Do you have anything that you have worked on recently? Um, I do. I have three COVID paintings that I will show you. Hold on yes. <laughs> She's been telling us about these and has not shown them to us yet. So I'm as excited as all of you are. So I'm trying to see how I get it into the frame. So the, I don't know if you can tell, this is one of those long horizontal paintings. It's an abstract. It's got a lot of texture to it. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay. And this is, this is sort of my, my um, you know how, how during this and being at home and, he, and doing things remotely and doing classes has been really, um, sometimes really frustrating. Um, people feel like they've lost things. This is sort of me um, laying it on the canvas about what it feels like to be in the middle of a pandemic. So that, that's number one. You wanna see another one? Yes, please. Yes. Those of you who painted Blaze, We'll appreciate this one because it's got the gold and green. And again, it's one of the, it's a long, long horizontal painting. And I don't know if you can tell from it, but there's um, a lot of playing with texture and stamping and different ways to uh, create effects. But it's, um, it's UAB colors. So this one was painted for the office. And when we're done with this, it will go into the office. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I think, just going to double check, we probably have time for one question, if there is one in the chat. There are no questions in the chat yet. We do have a couple comments. Amy Atkinson says, thank you for taking a chance on Birmingham. And Leanne mm -hmm. Doss says, first time attending, much appreciated. Take care. Um, and Mary Foster just said, we still have a wall in Dr. Butler's, Dr. Butler's office that needs some artwork hinted. I do get requests. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems yes, like there's, you a, there's a line. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, yeah, it seems, it seems like there's going to be quite a few after this, too, that might start to request it as well. Um, well, and you even I'm, pointed out the wall that needs help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it sounds like you've already got a line going even further than what it did. Um, so I want to thank you, Dr. Benoit, so much for taking your time to, to be with us tonight. This has been fantastic. Before you guys hang up, if you guys will, I'm going to exit the, um, whoops, I'm going to go cancel the spotlight and then go to gallery view because one of the favorite things about uh, Colory Night is to see how, uh, how, where we got with our coloring. I never get very far. I promise I will put it up on social media. But guys, go ahead and turn it on and uh, and show kind of how where you got with your um, with your colorings. Very we'll, cool. Um, we'll be sure. Oh, to do I love them. And Christina, do you want to mention about Instagram? And yes, I do. Um, so if you guys, uh, when you finish them.
and feel free to take your time because I will be working on mine the rest of tonight. Uh, please be sure to put them on Instagram and tag us at Ava UAB. So that is A E I V A UAB. And then, uh, Dr. Benoit, if it's okay for them to tag you in it as of well, course. So that way you can uh, can share as well. So uh, her uh, Instagram handle is Pam P A M underscore Benoit B E N O I T underscore U A B. Um, so I am going to put those in the chat, and uh, well, I'm going to I copied and pasted them, but it's not going to let me, so I'm going to type it. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for coming. This is, this has been absolutely wonderful. And I've really enjoyed getting to see all of uh, your new artwork and kind of the, the, uh, the trajectory of it as well. I got to see your show when you, when you first mm -hmm. got here, uh, at edge of chaos. Um, but there were so many people I didn't get to go around and see every single one up close. So this has been a complete delight and getting to talk to you about it more has been absolutely wonderful. So thank you. Oh, thank you. So and much. thank you all again so much for coming. I really, I really appreciate it. And I hope you had fun. Yes, uh, I know I did. So thank you guys. And thank you, everything you've been doing for UAB as well. So thank you, uh, thank you all. And we hope to see you back here in July. Uh, please sign up for our email list or um, uh, follow us on Instagram and Facebook for our next set of live events and don't forget next thursday is inside the arts so be sure to um sign up for that one we hope to see you guys again soon great bye, bye, bye. everyone bye.